Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. What we're going to talk about today starts, as always, with a map, uh, so that those who may have missed uh, an earlier class, here's Hanoi in the north, here's Ho Chi Minh City or Saigon in the south, Cambodia, Thailand, Myanmar or Burma, India over here, and of course the behemoth, China, of which you only see the leading edge. Uh, and uh, just to remind you all, uh, it's about a thousand miles from top to bottom. All right. Is that a name that some of you may have heard of once or twice? How many Bostonians do we have? Oh, one or two, yes. Yes. So who was he? He was the son of a wealthy, very right-wing, self-made businessman who welcomed Joe McCarthy as a welcome guest in his home. When I say his home, I'm talking about uh, uh, Joe Kennedy, John's father. John was a Catholic son raised by a strict Catholic mother, a graduate of Harvard College, a Navy combat veteran of World War II, now, of course, if he was running for office today, Donald Trump would say, hey, you had your PT boat cut in two and sunk. I like people who can keep their PT boat on the top of the water, not on the bottom. <laughs> Did I do a good job with that? <laughs> the truth is, a very young Jack Kennedy conceivably could have been the tiniest bit negligent that night. It's not clear. But what happened after his boat got cut in two is absolutely extraordinary because of this very skinny young man who was already very ill and had to lie his way into the Navy uh, rescued his crewmen under absolutely extraordinary circumstances. A genuine war hero, gold-plated war hero, and a cold warrior. He was a politician of his time. He, he came to uh, maturity after the war in the late 40s and across the 50s. He, he was a cold warrior. But he was also an internationalist, uh, like almost everybody, an anti-communist, a centrist. Everybody talks about him as if he was a liberal. Well, it depends on how you define it. He was right in the middle, and he chose to be in the middle. Uh, and above all, a pragmatist. Um, his father, in 51 maybe, uh, preparing him uh, for his political career, sent him on a round the world trip. Um, and uh, he visited Southeast Asia and he visited um, uh, Vietnam as a, just before he ran for Congress. In, I think he got elected in 52, but he, this trip was in 51. And uh, he had some very prescient things to say about uh, uh, Vietnam, which of course was in the middle of a war of independence with uh, the French. And he said that the French uh, were in a doomed exercise trying to uh, keep it as a colony and that uh, there because this is in the middle of the war. He said the Vietnamese people's success or failure would turn on how committed they themselves were to their own struggle. And uh, you'll see some of that very shortly. Now here's a flash quiz. I'm sure that almost all of you <coughs> can name all the males in that picture. <coughs> if you stop and think about it uh, for a second. But how many of you can name all the females? There are so many of them. Uh, but we'll leave that for another day. <laughs> and here we are at uh, his inauguration. Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike that the torch has been passed to a new generation of Americans born in this century, tempered by war, disciplined by a hard and bitter peace, 
proud of our ancient heritage and unwilling to witness or permit the slow undoing of those human rights to which this nation has always been committed and to which we are committed today at home and around the world. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill that we shall pay any price, bear any burden, meet any hardship, support any friend, oppose any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. To those new states whom we welcome to the ranks of the free, we pledge our word that one form of colonial control shall not have passed away merely to be replaced by a far more iron tyranny. We shall not always expect to find them supporting our view, but we shall always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom and to remember that in the past those who foolishly sought power by riding the back of the tiger ended up inside. To those people in the huts and villages of half the globe struggling to break the bonds of mass misery, we pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. For whatever period is required, not because the communists may be doing it, not because we seek their votes, but because it is right. If a free society cannot help the many who are poor, it cannot save the few who are rich. Let us never negotiate out of fear, but let us never fear to negotiate. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. A thank you to Bob DeRocha for doing a brilliant job of editing because that's uh, about three and a half minutes out of a 15-minute speech. And I must say that the uh, man behind that lectern had a way with words. Uh, and we're going to take a look at one or two of them just quickly because they're kind of extraordinary. If you read the whole 15 minutes, and you know, it's online, there's either virtually no mention or literally no mention of any domestic issue or policy. It's 100% about foreign policy, uh, which is pretty unusual. And uh, uh, let's take a look at this part. Let every nation know whether it wishes us well or ill. That we, now follow. It's any price, any burden, any hardship, any friend, any foe to assure the survival and the success of liberty. That's pretty absolute. I mean, there is not a lot of wiggle room in that pledge. But thank goodness, there's a little wiggle room. Here to uh, new states, he pledges the word of the United States that uh, colonial rule should not be replaced by dictatorship. I think we all feel pretty good about that. And here's a key wiggle. Uh, even if they disagree with us, we always hope to find them strongly supporting their own freedom. And of course, that was the huge problem that we faced in Vietnam. 
half the country, uh, and I'm using the word half in a very rough sense, defined freedom in a way totally different from the way we do, and the other half uh, never found a leader that they felt enthusiastic enough about to support, uh, and were largely, I won't say apathetic, because that's the wrong word, but they were passive or uninvolved. And to those people in the Hudson villages of half the globe, and boy, they're, you know, I'm not sure how many TV sets there were in the rice paddies of Vietnam at that time, but to the extent that anybody in Vietnam read this, they, they must have thought, well, President Kennedy's talking to us. We pledge our best efforts to help them help themselves. There's some wiggle room there, right? Which um, actually I think had he lived, might have uh, played a role in how he would have handled Vietnam. But as I never tire of saying, he didn't live, so it's completely irrelevant. We should move on. Uh, so here we have an interesting uh, statistic. Number of US advisors in Vietnam at the end of Ike's term, on that day that uh, Kennedy was behind the podium, 900. And at the end of JFK's term, when he was murdered, 16,000. That's a big difference. But he was still referring to them as advisors. Now, there's advisors and there's advisors. If you're in uh, Vietnam and you call me up collect and I accept the charges, I could give you a lot of advice over the telephone. I'd be happy to. But if you're trying to teach them how to um, engulf a Viet Cong uh, battalion and you're out there in the rice paddies with them, you are advising. <laughs> but you're in a very different posture than uh, a fellow behind the lines. The 16,000 were in combat to a significant degree, and actually the 900 uh, got shot at plenty of times, even though when they were originally sent, they really were sent as trainers, advisors, etc. cetera. Uh, I was in touch with a guy who literally had a job, an important job, in an office building in downtown Saigon. And he got on the bus one day and it blew up, and not by accident. Uh, it's a miracle that he's alive to tell the story. So, but still in all, the difference between 900 and 16,000 is a real a difference of degree. Of course, by the time LBJ finished, we were at close to 550,000. Uh, and again, that's a snapshot at, at a moment in time. Uh, two, two and a half million American men and women served in Vietnam. And, um, and again, even though the bulk of them were not in the trenches, they were in support roles, uh, it was a dangerous place to be. They could not, the, the North Vietnamese, and the Viet Cong in the South. The, we, use, we use the word Viet Cong to mean the guerrilla forces from the South, in the South, um, that were run by the NLF, the National Liberation Front. And uh, for much of the Vietnam War, they were a lot more independent of North Vietnam than we thought at the time. At the time, we thought they were just another arm of the Hanoi government. At later periods, they were. But in much of the time, uh, or during much of the time, they w were quasi-independent. Most of them really were Southerners uh, from the southern half of Vietnam. Uh, and they worked very closely with the, the Hanoi government. But they had their own opinions. Now, they couldn't defeat the United States. You, you must stop thinking, in my view, that we, quote, lost the war. What we failed to do was we failed to achieve the objective that we sought when we went into Vietnam. But we didn't get beaten militarily. But just as George Washington was able to stalemate uh, the British uh, in our war of independence, simply by surviving, 
And those of you who have taken my winter course know that, you know, he barely survived and didn't really make any headway until um, Imperial France came to our assistance. They were able to survive, uh, both the North and the Viet Cong, uh, by stalemating us. And I want to show you how they did it. We all clear? That's the question. In your own minds, form a very simple picture of the answer. I'll show you my picture. This lady broke the back of the United States government effort in Vietnam. You may notice she's pregnant. And that's what defeated us. I see a couple of quizzical looks. All right, let's take a look at what I mean. <clears throat> there are various estimates of how many North Vietnamese military, you know, regular North Vietnamese army in uniforms with guns and artillery and all that stuff, plus the Viet Cong, the guerrillas. There are various estimates of how many uh, of those soldiers they lost. The current Vietnamese government, the Hanoi government, says it was 1,100,000 over the course. These estimates, you have to take round numbers because some people who are estimating measure from 1954 or 55, some people measure from 65. And what I've tried to do is take a range of them and make an estimate in between. The Defense Department says that from uh, uh, 65 to 73, which was a period of our greatest involvement, it was 950,000. A variety of professionals, you know, mostly academicians, uh, have, uh, you know, quite a uh, in-depth study. Does that include civilians? No, this is just military. And, is, and we're only talking about the North Vietnamese soldiers and the Viet Cong soldiers. But when you put it all together and average it all out, which is fine for our purposes, the uh, North Vietnamese government forces, including the Viet Cong, were losing about 100,000 soldiers a year for 10 years. Now, North Vietnam at that time had about uh, 15 or 18 million people. That is a, and this is just soldiers, that is a gargantuan number. But watch this. The average annual live male births in Vietnam between 1940 and 1955, which yields young men between the ages of 20, uh, about the age of 20, between 1960 and 1975, right? They had an inexhaustible supply. We could not kill them fast enough. And we killed a lot of them. But we weren't even in the same league with my lady in blue. Because she and her sisters were churning them out at a rate far beyond our ability to kill them. And the North Vietnamese were very much aware of it and kept track of it. Because they knew uh, that they were fighting a war of attrition and believed that they could win it. Oh, there's our enemy. That's who beat us. Could any of them stand up to our uh, forces? They, at the company level, you know, a company is about 100 men. Yeah, they ambushed a few of uh, our companies and they, you know, they did some real damage at the company level. At the battalion level, no. And we're going to look at that. Of course, we could have killed a lot more. At Khe San, which we're going to look at, uh, General West Westmoreland made his collect call into the Defense Department and asked for permission to use tactical nuclear weapons. I mean, he made a formal request to use tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, uh, you know, Curtis LeMay, the 
earlier head of the Air Force was of the view that we, this is much earlier, uh, was of the view that we should bomb them back to the Stone Age. We actually had the capability to bomb them back to the Stone Age. But that wasn't our goal. Our goal was to create in South Vietnam a peaceful, united, uh, democratic, open society. At least that's what we said our goal was. And, you know, you can't drop tactical nuclear weapons on people that you're trying to win the hearts and minds of. We had the most highly efficient warriors in, in the world, and uh, they couldn't beat Vietnam's birth rate. The kill ratio, which varied a lot over the years uh, and from place to place, was anywhere from 10 to 20 to 1. Uh, as high as that was, and it was extremely high, it wasn't high enough. We could have killed them all. <laughs> but then, remember the iconic photograph of the American soldier with the Zippo lighter lighting the hut? Uh, we had to destroy the village to save it. Uh, here's a happy man. We all know him by now, right? General Jiao, uh, who lived to be 102. I think I mentioned this. He just died uh, two years ago, I think. Here's what he had to say about a war of attrition. Every minute, hundreds of thousands of people die on this earth. The life or death of a hundred, a thousand, tens of thousands of human beings, even our own compatriots, means little. Now that wasn't the view of the typical Vietnamese citizen. But this isn't the typical Vietnamese citizen. This uh, is a fellow who, for much of the period we're talking about, was the second or third in command. Yes, sir? Casey, was the ordinary birth rate <coughs> same kind of figures before the war. And so, I mean, the, the, the country was just producing, naturally they were producing a lot damage. of people. So they weren't doing it because of the, no, the killing on the killing. No, we're talking, uh, we're talking about a birth rate that was occurring between 1940 and 1955. That's right. <laughs> you remember the opening picture on this series of those women bent over at the waist all day long in the rice paddies? Then at night? <laughs> it, was, it was a tough, tough life all around. And that's just because it was a cute picture I picked out. Okay. But, but actually, I'm glad you said that. Uh, the, the North Vietnamese Army, the actual soldiers with guns, was mostly men. But remember when I showed them pulling the cannon up the hill at DMB and Phu? A lot of women. And part of Jap's genius was organizing uh, women uh, uh, to support the soldiers. And in the NLF, National Liberation Front that ran the Viet Cong in the South, a lot of women carrying guns. A lot of women carrying guns. In fact, uh, very senior people, in addition to the grunts, you know, in the foxholes, very senior people in the Viet Cong were women. Every important person in the American leadership, except for the generals in charge in Vietnam, understood that in order to achieve our goal in Vietnam, we had to win the hearts and minds of the South Vietnamese people a people that were largely Buddhist and animist, largely rural peasant population. And I regret I put the word peasant up there. It was a big mistake on my part, and I apologize to the Vietnamese across 10,000 miles. I should say yeoman farmers, just the way we talk about our yeoman farmers. We don't call uh, the people at the time of George Washington peasant or peasant farmers. It's a put down which slipped by me and I apologize for it. They were yeoman farmers. Kennedy knew all about the hearts and minds. Uh, I think this comes from a speech he gave when he got back from that 1951 trip to Southeast Asia. Johnson 
said it over and over and over again, uh, that our goal was to win the hearts and minds of the Vietnamese people so that we could help them, help themselves create a viable, non-repressive, open society. Sending of uh, up to a half a million or over a half a million. That's a very good question. What this gentleman asked is how do you do that when you're sending 550,000 soldiers to a tiny little country? Each of you can watch today as I go through this and reach your own conclusions. In fact, the military methods we used most successfully were the very ones, namely aerial bombing and long-range artillery, that inevitably caused the highest rates of civilian casualties. We chose methods of killing that were most effective against soldiers, but by their very nature were most likely to cause large civilian casualties. And by the way, if I were some guy out there on the battlefield getting to pick yeah, get the artillery in there. <laughs> I mean, uh, you got to be realistic about what kind of choices you face when uh, your life is on the line. And uh, Did you go back a moment to that other slide? Am I wrong or is that other slide geographically incorrect when it says uh, the harm and casualties in South Vietnam? What does sound? It was the north Yeah, but we were fighting them in the south. We bombed in the north, but our troops, with the exception of some incursions into Laos and some commando raids into North Vietnam, our troops were all in the south. The war occurred in the south. Nixon, which comes later, Nixon sent some troops into uh, Laos, uh, but uh, other than brief commando raids, the entire war was fought in the South, except for our bombing. And that comes later. That's next week's class. All right? The war as we know it, the troops that we sent in, the 550,000, all in the South. What you are looking at is a typical Vietnamese village. But you're looking at it something like three seconds after an American phantom jet has dropped napalm. That village doesn't exist anymore. And by the way, they didn't just drop napalm. This is white phosphorus bombs. Which was or was not illegal at this point? I have no idea. I'm focused on how we chose to fight the war. You thought it, you may have thought it was tough when you saw that photograph of the GI with his Zippo lighter burning down a hooch, as we like to call their homes, right? And it was. But this is how we did it. We didn't burn down that many hooches. This is how we uh, fought one portion of the war. Now, I'm going to show you some very good things we did as well. but. This was not designed to win the hearts and minds. And my point here, and I hope you understand this, my point here is not to criticize the guy in that jet or the guy with the zippo, lighter. My point is to highlight that all of our civilian leaders said that our goal was to win their hearts and minds to help them create an open society a free, non-repressive society. And I believe them. When Kennedy said it, when Johnson said it, I believe them. I still believe that that's what they intended. But this is how they went about it. This wasn't indiscriminate. This was <coughs> intended to destroy villagers that were known to be harboring and supporting the enemy. That's the official story. <laughs> and it's been proven false 10,000 times. I believed that at the time. And I was against the war, but I did believe that, right? I truly believed it. And I was wrong, wrong, wrong. And it took me 50 years of study to finally admit to myself that it was dead wrong. 
because the Viet Cong and their sympathizers were completely intermingled with the people who were apathetic and with the people who were pro uh, an open democratic society. In addition, the Air Force, more than anybody else, and it's the leadership of the Air Force, not the guy in the plane, decided that the way to really promote the Air Force and build it up and get lots of money from Congress was to have free fire zones where they could go in and do this. And a free fire zone would be where, well, they're all Viet Cong in this area, so there's no point in uh, you know, going in and trying to fight it out hooch by hooch. If you could get them uh, to agree to put free fire zone, FFZ, on a map, bam, in you go. And if you read uh, A Bright Shining Lie, which is Neil Sheehan's torrid discussion of uh, this aspect, you will, Bob wants me to step back, but Bob, when I do this, I creak so loudly on the wooden floor, it's driving me crazy. It's better than the DJ. Okay. You may choose to believe, as I did for years, that this was okay because this was VC. It's a village. It's where men and women and children are living their lives, and it was eliminated in an instant. It's the micro-techno version of an atom bomb for a village. It's gone. How about the children? Were they VC? How about the old men? Were they VC? Well, old women, too. How about the babies? Were the babies VC? This gun can throw a heavy shell 20 or 30 miles. It is amazingly effective, and the projectile, when it lands, makes a gargantuan explosion. And it can be highly specific and effective if you have a spotter 20 or 30 miles away with a radio uh, you know, phone telling this guy uh, up five uh, degrees over a little to the left. But in order to have that kind of communication, you've got to have a, either a guy on the ground right near where the shell is scheduled to fall, or maybe in a helicopter, or in one of those little uh, Piper Cub plane, spotter planes, I think they call them L9s, or they did at the time. And that's extremely dangerous. It is extremely dangerous. There were American soldiers who volunteered to be spotters, and they were extraordinarily effective. But when the South Vietnamese uh, were given these guns, nobody volunteered to be a spotter. They just didn't. So these guns fired at sectors. And the effect was the same, a complete wipeout, indiscriminate. Uh, it didn't have to be that way. Uh, and the Americans were often uh, very effective in keeping it uh, accurate. Uh, and the, uh, there have been, from soldiers on the ground who spent two, three, four years in Vietnam, bitter, bitter uh, recriminations about the higher-ups who uh, declared free fire zones indiscriminately uh, and created a situation where hearts and minds uh, were completely turned off to the Americans. So those are possibly not the best way to win the hearts and minds of these folks. Uh, we need to come to grips with that because it's, at least for me, it's extremely unpleasant. We had a goal that I think most Americans could feel good about. And we had methods that we should have known in advance and did know in advance were not calculated to achieve that goal. Now, because it's so complex, I'm going to pick out uh, five different spots to look at this, uh, and also some good things. 
because don't lose sight of the fact that we did some amazingly good things in Vietnam for the Vietnamese. Um, we're going to look at the Strategic Hamlets program, and I'm going to say a brief word about uh, the sort of correlative thing that was going on in North Vietnam. We're going to take a quick look at the Battle of Ap Bac, which uh, was in Jan the first couple of days of January 1963 and became iconic because of Neil Sheehan's book about John Paul Van, who was the senior American advisor on the ground. Uh, and uh, the book became, you know, a huge bestseller. We're going to look at the murder of President uh, No Dinh Diem and the political instability that followed. We're going to look at the endless escalation and we're going to look at Khe San, which was also iconic, which people said was the American DNB and Fu, uh, which had a very different um, outcome. And then uh, the very last slide, I'm going to give you a one, or one slide prologue to where we're going to begin next week with Tet the Tet battle, which was both a huge military victory and a huge psychological defeat. So let, let's look at the strategic, the strategic Hamlets program, which lasted, you know, about uh, a year and a third. And it was done uh, by ZM at our urging, because we had told them, you're not going to win hearts and minds if you don't have true land redistribution and land reform. If you don't take land away that's lying fallow from the big landlords and give it to the yeoman farmers, that's how you're going to build uh, support for your government. And we were 100% right in saying it. Uh, it was right then, it's right now. Uh, and it was designed to relocate millions of Vietnamese farmers and villagers into fortified villages where they could be protected from the Viet Cong. At least we thought that protection was the goal. Uh, Diem and his government decided to have a slightly different uh, goal. And they did it with uh, amazing speed. By the end of the program, uh, eight and a half million villagers had been moved out of their homes into 7,200 strategic hamlets. We financed the whole thing, a billion dollars. Uh, and the speed was astonishing. But then some things happened. This is what a, a typical village looked like before. This is just your average 1960 Vietnamese village. Uh, because everything is green, it looks uh, nice. Uh, but actually, you know, it's, uh, it's a third world rural farm village. And it's within a five or ten minute walk of two key things. Their own farm fields and their ancestors' tombs, which are sacred to them. It's like for an Orthodox Jew who wants to be within walking distance of his synagogue because on the Sabbath he doesn't want to ride in a car, right? So being uh, within walking distance of your fields and your ancestors' tombs is extremely important to these folks. But what happened was that the villagers were very often forced to move to these new villages at gunpoint, which suggests, to me at least, that they weren't all that enthusiastic about going. Because they hated leaving their own home. Just picture yourself, any one of you. Uh, excuse me, I have a really nice home for you uh, a couple of miles away. You have to move now, today, right this second. All right? All right? you would not be all that happy. They were forced to build their new hamlet and its fortifications from scratch. Now the Diem government, thanks to us, <coughs> supplied the building materials uh, and they had to build them in accordance with government plans and specs. Oh, you don't mind moving? Yeah, but you're gonna move to the house I want you to build. Here are the plans and specs. No, 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 I'm not interested in what you think. It's what I think that counts. It's only your home, for heaven's sakes. Don't get all emotional on me. And they often had to watch, since they were leaving under duress and were kicking and screaming, they often had to watch their old homes being bulldozed, which has an emotional impact uh, 
that's substantial. This is what it looks like from the air. You can see it was, well, it looks so, to me, uh, I don't know if you, I was uh, in the early, early and mid-60s, I worked on some kibbutzim in Israel in the desert. It kind of looks like a kibbutz, built for protection. And some of them were actually nice, some. But a lot of them looked like concentration camps. Because the people who were inside weren't there voluntarily. Now, the Ziem government started out with great intentions and I'm not saying that sarcastically. I will be sarcastic later. I will highlight that for you, but I'm not being sarcastic now. They promised to provide military security from the Viet Cong, which for many of these farmers was a big positive. Financial compensation for the move, which they reneged on because there was such corruption that all the money that we provided to give them compensation went into various Vietnamese officers' pockets. Medical and social services, they did some. Classrooms and teachers, ah, they struck out. Why? Because if you had the wherewithal to have the education and be a teacher in Vietnam, these were the last places in the world you wanted to go, as you'll see. And access to either the old farmlands or to ones that were good or better, that was a zero. They, they never achieved that. Would have been better maybe if they hadn't made any promises at all, but this is what happened. The requirement that they construct their own villages and their own fortifications meant there were untold days of unpaid labor, and it was a lot of hard work and a lot of resentment. And villagers quickly realized that the, as opposed to the United States, and the United States' intentions, the actual aim of the Ziem government, as villagers quickly realized, was to ID them and register them all to keep track for the military draft, for taxes, for political and subversive activities, and NLF sympathies. In the United States, there have been suggestions for good and sufficient reasons uh, to have a national identity card. It has been, and we're at peace, it has been rejected resoundingly by all sectors of the American population over and over again. Uh, but that wasn't true in Vietnam. Diem wanted to get a handle on who was who and what were they doing and where were they. Now, uh, Pham Ngoc Tao was put in charge. He had demonstrated uh, earlier some real get up and go. When he took this program over, he was the most vigorous, uh, high, dynamic person in the South Vietnam military. I mean, he was extraordinary. And uh, he said the chief goal was to get this done as fast as possible. And over objections, he said, and let's demonstrate early success by putting them, uh, the first ones, in areas uh, with a strong uh, Viet Cong control and the results of doing it, and he, he was, with, with the Viet Cong all around, he got in there with troops and with construction crews and with the villages and he got this done. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Unfortunately, the speed uh, led to very shoddy implementation, massive corruption, payoffs and bribes, massive. Blackmail as villagers said, I don't wanna go. I got a brother-in-law who lives over there. I'm, I'll move in with him. Well, you pay me so many piastres and you can wander off and I won't keep track of you. Coercion. <coughs> Coercion. And ultimately an enraged rural population. Underline the word enraged. And hamlets filled with VC sympathizers because Tao went into the areas where they were most prevalent at the start. He, it had been suggested he should do the exact opposite. He should go where the uh, locals were, st were strongly in favor of the Ziem government 
and then as he demonstrates his success, he could spread out from there, he went the other way. So the question which was raised at the time was how could the Zm brothers and Tao have been so incredibly stupid in doing it so bass backwards? The answer was simple. He was a secret agent of the North Vietnamese government. They made him a one-star general. Posthumously. Because they did finally catch up with him. They put a soldier of the North Vietnamese government in charge of this entire program and gave him all the power and authority he needed to run it into the ground. I pick this example out of the many, many things we could talk about uh, because we and the South Vietnamese government never conquered the whole corruption, bribery, uh, institutional dishonesty that was endemic in the South. The North Vietnamese ultimately did by murdering everybody, and we're going to talk about that in a minute. They had a solution that I think most of us would have a problem with. Oh, we caught you with your hand in the pocket? You're dead. No trial needed. I see your hand. It's in the pocket. Bang! You're gone. It worked, but that's not the kind of society we want to live in either. So North Vietnam, South Vietnam, you start to, it starts to raise the issue, not answer, but raise the issue of moral equivalence. What was happening to rice farmers in North Vietnam? It was better and it was worse. Remember, in 1960, Ho Chi Minh retired. Only none of us in the United States, outside the CIA, seem to understand that. And this guy, Lei Zhuan, took over. Now, Ho Chi Minh didn't die until 1969, and he still had enormous influence, you know, in 61. But what every historian I've ever read said that with every passing year, his influence got less and less and less, because Lei Zhuan, uh, who was a southerner, when he took over the North Vietnamese government, uh, uh, had some very different views about how things should be done. So what they did in North Vietnam when it came to redistributing land was, number one, they really did it. They took all the land that the big landlords owned and they really, truly redistributed. Everybody got two acres, all right? And no ifs, ands, or buts. Everybody got two acres. Now there were no more landless peasants. Now there were no more uh, yeoman farmers paying rent. Everybody on their own land. So I'm thinking, well, what did they do with the uh, former owners, the big farmers who owned a lot of land and the landlords who were absentee? You know, did they uh, just give them two acres and say, all right, be my guest. Here's your two acres. Or did they say, look, you're a threat to our society. You're never going to change. You're a landlord born and you're going to die a landlord. So go to the south. Here's your ticket on the train. Goodbye. Or they could have said, oh, you're, you're a criminal what you've been doing. You go to jail. Or what North Vietnam liked to do with others was you go to a political re-education camp for 10 years. All right? No, they didn't do that. They murdered them all. They murdered them all for no apparent reason. And, and usually it was the men and the wives and children were left to starve to death. And there are accounts by North Vietnamese of being afraid to go down the road to a neighbor and give them food because then they would be murdered. The men were just shot or buried alive, or guillotined, the women and children were left to starve to death as an object lesson, although what the lesson is? Well, Lei Zhuan had studied Lenin and believed in terror as a social organizational tool. His chief assistant was Lei Dak who you'll see much later, 
uh, the, uh, as the smiling negotiator uh, with uh, Henry Kissinger. Uh, then, this was in, uh, this occurred between 58 and 62. Then at the end of the 60s, um, and the beginning of the 70s, uh, Le Juan decided that we ought to have real communism and create collectives. And that went down so poorly in North Vietnam that there was an uprising in the Red River Delta, the area south and east of Hanoi, that's the equivalent in the north of the Mekong Delta, uh, south and east of Saigon. You've got the Red River Delta in the north, the Mekong Delta in the south. And they tried uh, collectivization, a lot of uh, preparatory pr propaganda. The North Vietnamese farmers rejected it. Uh, and they said, no, no, you got to do it. And so there was an uprising, sort of like Shays' Rebellion in Western Massachusetts. And the reaction was the same. The North Vietnamese government sent in the army and crushed them. And nobody knows how many were killed. The North Vietnamese say that it was about 15,000 was killed. Yes, sir? I'm sorry. My question was, um, was this after the war ended? No. No, this was at the very end, uh, 69, 70, 71, somewhere in there, uh, the collectivization effort uh, was uh, just a dreadful mistake. In fact, the North Vietnamese government actually issued an apology afterwards to its citizens. Uh, I'm not opposed to apologies, but when the people you're apologizing to are dead, I have a certain skepticism about the uh, moral value of the apology. Uh, by late 62, though, now we're, we're going back, the Viet Cong in the South, the guerrillas in the South, the National Liberation Front, which ran the guerrilla operations in the South, uh, were exhausted. And they weren't getting much help from the North, because the North, starting in 55, 56, Ho Chi Minh had made a decision. Uh, the South will have to take care of itself for a while. We're too overextended and overburdened from the French War. We got to build up the North. We're in charge of the North. That's what we got out of the Geneva Accords. We got to build up the North and become powerful. Uh, we got to build up our agriculture. We got to start and build up an industrial base. And we don't have time for the South. And that's one of the reasons Le Juan uh, was very happy to push Ho Chi Minh aside because Le Juan was a southerner, even though he took over after Ho Chi Minh, he took over the North Vietnamese government. And uh, the uh, North Vietnamese government did not provide a lot of help in those years after the Geneva Accords uh, until finally Le Juan in 19, late 1960 persuaded uh, the um, highest level of the North Vietnamese government to at least announce that, well, we'll make development of the South and the revolution in the South of equal importance with the North. But really, that was just an announcement. It was important. It was a policy change. But it didn't have immediate effect. And uh, uh, the um, guerrillas in the South were really uh, in trouble. And had we understood that, the CIA did, by the way, but they didn't get anybody else in the United States government to understand that. Uh, we could have taken advantage of it. The biggest problem with the army, the ARVN, A -R -V -N, the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the North Vietnamese government is the DRV, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. <coughs> the ARVN is the Army of the Republic of South Vietnam. That's, uh, it's confusing, but I, I'll try to keep it clear. The, the troops could be very effective, but it was a, a problem that was systemic that never got solved. The officers were men of wealth and education, uh, upper class. It was a real class system. And the problem wasn't merely, in fact, 
the, the heart of the problem wasn't that they were educated and upper class and wealthy. The problem was that they regarded their troops as peasants and worms. They had very little respect for their own troops. And they also, and this was what really hurt their morale over and over again, the, the officers, there were exceptions, but across the army of the Republic of South Vietnam, the officers were in it for money. It was that simple. And even if, they, even if they were idealistic people, and there were, John Paul Van, this colonel who was the advisor, he uh, found uh, South Vietnamese officers who weren't in it for the money, but to get promoted, you had to buy your promotion from the general. So you could either you know, stay a lieutenant for the rest of your life, or if you wanted to rise in the army, you had to pay off the people. They, it was a terrible, terrible situation, and the troops knew that. Uh, so the VC uh, decided in January of 63 that they got to stand up to this increasing American presence. The, they got to make a statement to Diem, Diem's forces, and they pick up back. Now, it's very hard. I'm going to show you a map, but you got to blend in your mind's eye this and the map. This is a huge arc like this, right? And it's got all of this brush here, and then it's got this tree line here. And in between uh, this kind of uh, vegetation and the trees, uh, there's an irrigation ditch, fairly deep. You can stand up in it. And what the uh, uh, Viet Cong did was they put the equivalent of sandbags and rice bags and other kinds of uh, shock absorbing, or I should say uh, artillery shell absorbing materials all along here. But it still looked like this when they got through with it. It still looked like there was nobody there. And the irrigation ditch they deepened so that they could have communication along the entire arc. And behind that, they hid their reserves. Uh, and they studied, the, they knew the uh, Americans were hot to get the Arvin, the South Vietnamese army, out there. Uh, and they, their spies had discovered that the American intelligence, the army intelligence, had learned that they, the Viet Cong, had a radio transmitter here. So the Americans told the South Vietnamese, this is an important place. Uh, it has a radio transmitter. We should go and attack it and uh, uh, you know, make some hay. Uh, the only thing the Americans were wrong about was their estimate of the number of troops, which wasn't terrible. They said, the Americans said to their South Vietnamese counterparts, we think there's about 120 troops. Uh, in fact, there were 300, uh, which shouldn't have been the end of the world. Uh, and then more came in later. And the Arvin Field Commander on the left, Colonel Cow, uh, and his U.S. advisor on the right, John Paul Van, who became literally a legend in his own time, uh, were chosen for this because they had had some real success and uh, Van had been prepping Cow for months on how to be aggressive. Uh, and he thought that he had really trained him to be a warrior. Uh, and Van proved to be wrong because he didn't understand what Cao's principal motivations were. The Arvin, the South Vietnamese forces, had uh, armored personnel carriers, helicopters, modern arms, air support. They went in full-blooded, ready you know, for an action. The Viet Cong had this very strong defensive position and a good plan and surprise. Their arms were, the, North, the Viet Cong arms were far weaker. They didn't have any, the, the strongest uh, uh, armament they had were mortars hidden uh, in those irrigation ditches and behind the trees. Here's a map 
I won't spend a lot of time. Here's that arc. And the uh, plan that Van worked out with Cal was part of the Arvin units were going to come in this way, part would come in this way, and then part would come right up the middle. These are rice paddies. If you think about Gettysburg, there is a distinct similarity to the, to the Confederate forces. Uh, this would be the northern Union forces around Cemetery Ridge. Uh, and the various units were timed, so they all come in at once and overwhelm this force. And uh, unlike the French, the United States was providing loads of helicopters to send in the infantry in huge waves. But unfortunately, it didn't work out that way. The, this, this is actually kind of interesting. Throughout the war, the American Air Force did not like taking orders from the American infantry commanders. They just didn't like it. They understood intellectually that the Army and the Air Arm had to work together. But when John Paul Van said, you, I need you right here, right now, I said, <laughs> well, I can't say out loud what they actually said, but you can imagine. They just didn't like each other. And the Marines, and guess who the Marines dis disliked most of all? The Green Berets, because those guys were army. <laughs> Is, is a very difficult situation. There's been a huge improvement <laughs> since Vietnam in that regard. So the, uh, the air arm did not supply enough helicopters, despite the fact that they had all been arranged in advance. Uh, the arm and units didn't talk to each other. It's just a problem. They didn't talk to each other. And as you saw, this was supposed to be an envelopment around the left, around the right, up the middle. You know, coordination was the key to the whole thing. They didn't coordinate. But most of all, Cow had his own orders. He didn't take orders from this uh, little guy from uh, West uh, Kansas. Yeah, he said, yes, 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 I got it. John, you're a great guy. I understand. We're good. He took his orders from ZM. And ZM's only concern was to keep his best troops available to prevent a coup from other dissatisfied army generals. And he knew they were dissatisfied army generals because he was promoting all the Catholics and leaving aside all the Buddhists. And he knew, he knew, believe me, Zian was a smart guy. So he wanted to keep his loyal, excellent troops as untouched by battle as possible. And his orders were avoid combat to the maximum degree possible. And, and of course, the plan that Van worked out was that the heart of the plan was an aggressive, you know, let's go into heavy combat and wipe them out. And, and he didn't understand that Kyle wasn't going to do that. So his advice was ignored. And the result was that the Arvin forces got there late, were landed in the wrong place, suffered uh, casualties, uh, and the VC forces escaped. In Neil Sheehan's book, he really describes it brilliantly. You can just pick out those few chapters and read it if you're interested. Uh, this is an actual photograph of two of the five chapters. Chap choppers. Uh, I must give credit to the chopper pilots. They were amazingly heroic in trying to rescue uh, their countrymen. Uh, here's another one. Uh, this guy's happy because he was the colonel who uh, led the Viet Cong to victory at Ak Bak. He had prepped his people so they understood each uh, armament or armor that uh, uh, the Americans were going to throw at them, and they had a plan to respond to each. Oh, those troop, those armored personnel carriers? The way Americans do it is 
because did you notice that there's a guy sitting up in the turret who's kind of exposed? Well, you spread them out in a line going forward, and the defenders, you know, there's only so many that they can aim at, because they're all spread out. <laughs> the cow had his men line them all up in single file, so that the defenders could focus on the first guy, <coughs> second guy, <coughs> third guy, and the minute you shoot the guy in the turret, that armored personnel uh, carrier is e either, either uh, non-operable or being run by the guys down inside the, the tank body. So where, where did it all lead up to? There were a number of battles like that back. Uh, and the Strategic Hamlets program was, of course, a total failure. You had, as we discussed last time, the increasing hostility of the Buddhists. You had widespread government corruption, cronyism, incompetence, the complete failure of land re redistribution. So the US government, by the fall of 63, concluded that Diem had to go. And there's been a lot of controversy about whether that was a smart decision or not. But at the time, with very few exceptions, most of the senior people in the civil part of the Kennedy administration uh, thought that he had to go. In November of 63, there were two key turning points, two. One was the overthrow of Zim by his generals, who then murdered him in cold blood. There's no question we agreed to the coup. Because the generals, the South Vietnamese generals, said to us, hey, we're not going to do this unless we can be certain that you, the United States, are going to continue to support us with arms and money and all that. We said, yeah, OK, we will. But the issue is that we also agree to the murder of Diem and his brother. I kind of doubt it, but maybe. What was the other key turning point? Three weeks later, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dallas. And L LBJ becomes the US president. By the way, you all know who this is, right? Thank you very much. I'm glad that you're up on your, your governors. Nothing like a Texas governor. An iconic photograph uh, and a genuine tragedy. Kennedy had told his two closest advisors, and these guys were very close to him. They woke him up in the morning and kissed him goodnight at night, that he intended to get out of Vietnam after his reelection. So his reelection was more important than the 16,000 men living and dying in Vietnam. It's a harsh way to say it, but it's the truth. He could have gotten out any day he was the president. He could, in fact, people who say, oh, he never intended that, that's baloney, he had given a formal written directive to the Defense Department to work up the plan to get them all out by the end of 1965. Remember, the election would have been in November of 64. Now, I don't know whether he would have done it. I have the slightest idea. But it's pretty clear that he intended to. <coughs> Need we say more? The big mistake Johnson made was he kept the entire national security team of Kennedy in place. And they had already demonstrated by that time that they were no good. They were bright as hell, smarter than me. Halberstam wrote the book, quote, the best and the brightest, unquote. They were. Rusk and uh, McNamara and uh, McGeorge Bundy, his brother Bill Bundy, Walt Rostow, they were smart as hell and dumb as a post. IQ and good judgment, two separate things. <laughs> yes, indeed. McNamara, I will give him credit for this, at least years later, had regrets. They were psychologically committed to this uh, course that was clearly not working. Kennedy had told him it's not working. He had complained bitterly it's not working. The difference was that Kennedy had been burned so badly by the military and the CIA and the Bay of Pigs right after he became president that he was very cynical, uh, very cynical about 
uh, the military and didn't believe a word they said. But the rest of the guys around the table, uh, who mostly had no military experience at all, they took the Joint Chief's word you know, as gospel. And here are the two guys who gave the gospel. How am I doing? Oh, I have 15 minutes more? Yeah. All right, so we're going to have to go fast. Harkins followed by Westmoreland. They were, they were World War II guys. No, by the way, Westmoreland, who handled the buildup of 550,000, one of the greatest military managers we've ever had in terms of building cities, military cities in Vietnam and, and building systems to take all these men in. Remember, 550,000 was just the count at one moment in time. He had to deal with two to two and a half million men and women passing through. He's a brilliant manager, but his strategy was uh, doomed to failure. Guys like uh, Harkins and Westmoreland really believed that the South Vietnamese, the average South Vietnamese citizen, would understand that we're not the French. We're not here to colonize. We're different. We're here for your benefit. And, you know, in many, many respects, we were. But for this lady, looking out at her world from her rice paddy, we look the same. There's the French guy on the left. The American, uh, he's actually a Green Beret, but he left his beret at home. <laughs> like, they look the same, right? They absolutely look the same. Large white men with guns. When you look up from your rice paddy, what do you see? We didn't look any different from the French, even though, in fact, we were. You all recognize this guy? You don't? You'll tell me later. No. <laughs> look at the size of uh, the, the accompanying uh, um, caption with the photograph says that the American soldier who seems to tower over the Vietnamese soldiers who's actually my size, 5'8". <laughs> now, what you've got to keep in mind, and it's, I think, from a moral point of view, incredibly important, is that there were thousands of military and civilian Americans in Vietnam doing wonderful work doing absolutely wonderful work. And, and if you forget that, you're really forgetting uh, who we were, why we were there, and what we were trying to do. The fact that we did some things dreadfully wrong doesn't change the fact that we did a lot of things dreadfully right. Remember the movie, The Mouse That Roared? Some countries, you know, the joke was, please, America, please invade us. <laughs> we'll surrender the day you arrive, and you'll help us. We did. We gave a lot of help in a lot of ways, and it was wonderful to see. But it wasn't enough. It never is without a strong, honest, native government devoted to the best interests of its people, which is exactly what Jack Kennedy said in his inaugural address. We'll help you help yourselves. Well. The problem was that the South Vietnamese people included enormous numbers who couldn't stand the communists. And they never found a leader worth following. It's that simple to say. There were huge numbers of South Vietnamese people who were looking for their George Washington. And they looked at Ziem and they thought, well, that's not George. And they looked at these generals and they said, well, that's not George. But they were there. Uh, professionals, uh, the, the whole wealthy class, the landlord class, educated people, uh, endless numbers of urban workers, uh, uh, millions, literally millions of people in, in South Vietnam who would have been delighted to follow a leader uh, who would set up a non-right-wing repressive regime. And so you ended up with this huge war, which was very brutal and very destructive, the way all wars are. And of course, <coughs> you know, we're looking at that. 
American soldiers, probably more than any other soldiers in the world, somehow most of the time, not all the time, as you know, but most of the time kept their humanity. That's an American soldier in heavy combat. That's our best and brightest right there. So LBJ in March of 65, and there's that whole Tonkin Bay thing, which turns out to be semi-fraudulent, but he was all ready to go. He was looking for an incident to escalate because what the military, and Westmoreland in particular, were telling him was that the whole post-ZM government was about to collapse because the generals couldn't agree among themselves. Uh, and they weren't interested. Their first motive was not disinterested patriotism for the benefit of the Vietnamese people. That wasn't their first motive. Their first motive was money and power. I don't mind money and power. I just think if you're the, you know, the leadership of a country, it shouldn't be your first priority. So he decides to escalate. And curiously enough, out of the whole process uh, came General Chu and Air Commander Ki. By the way, if you want to go talk to these guys about the war, Ki is still alive uh, and kicking. He, uh, after the war, he moved to Southern California, owns a liquor store, and he's very happy to talk to you, I'm told. You can walk, he's, he's behind the counter and you can talk to him. And believe me, he has stories to tell. Originally, there were a bunch of generals. They all had big fights. We were about to kiss them all off. And then Chu and Ki got together and dominated for a while. And we said to them, well, you know, to build respectability at home and around the world, you have to have an election. So they had one of their, you know, Vietnam special elections. And um, Chu became the president. And he gradually pushed Ki aside. Ki was much younger and um, relative to two kind of naive. Fabulous pilot, uh, but a little naive about politics. And the Marines came ashore at Da Nang, and the escalation started. And as you can imagine, it was massive. Not every soldier was all that happy about waiting ashore. I think that's just one of the great photographs of the war. And it's important to remember that Johnson had a choice. There was no one ordering him to escalate. He was the decision maker. It was his decision. He did not communicate very well with the American people. He didn't say, uh, by the way, American people, we're going to send in a half a million troops to Vietnam. He never said that. He did it month by month. He had, he had other big programs, domestic programs, uh, remember, this is uh, a year after the um, Civil Rights Act. This is the year of the Voting Rights Act. This is the Great Society. He was very busy, and he did not want the American people to take their eye off the ball, so he lied to them about Vietnam, just the way Eisenhower did, just the way Kennedy did, and just the way Nixon did. He had. Uh, a heritage of lying to the American people about what his real goal was. You've got to hang on because we're running out of time. He wasn't forced to escalate. He chose to. And he later admitted that though he had a lot of pressure from a lot of different uh, groups, a major concern was his own re-election in 68. He feared that if he announced what his plan was, that he wouldn't get re-elected. And that's a man with troubles on his mind uh, and with good reason. Unfortunately, just as the CIA had told him in detail, his escalation was matched by China and the Soviet Union. The more he beefed up South Vietnam, the more China and the Soviet Union beefed up the DRV, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam, which is the North Vietnamese government. Uh, the Soviet Union sent all their material around on ships to Haiphong Harbor. Uh, China just sent it right down on the roads and railroads because they're right uh, above them. And just had been predicted by everybody. 
The CIA, the DIA, the NSA, you name it, they all told Johnson, you escalate, they're going to escalate. China actually sent soldiers, pilots, engineers, and workers because they wanted to free up young male North Vietnamese for actual frontline combat. So they came south over the border to provide a lot of infrastructure backup. And the rate of killing, of course, after 65 and the total number of killed annually increased dramatically, as you can imagine. But the stalemate continued. Escalation matched by escalation. And as powerful as we really were, and we really truly were, this lady beat us. She couldn't defeat the military, but she could defeat our achievement of our war aim. Our war aim, as we announced it, was not to defeat a, bata a battalion of the North Vietnamese. Our war aim was to create a viable, free, and democratic South Vietnamese society, and this lady and her million sisters beat us. Powerful? <laughs> she drove Johnson from office. Now, to be fair, and I see no reason why I should be fair, but I understand that a lot of people think being fair is important. I'm going to give you my opinion and show you that there's a lot of other opinion out there. My opinion is that to achieve our goal, our announced goal, would have required a million U.S. troops plus many hundreds of thousands of U.S. civilians stationed in Vietnam for a very long time and would have turned us into exactly what we swore we wouldn't and we believed we weren't, the colonial rulers of Vietnam. That's what it would have taken, in my opinion. And there are a lot of people who agree with me. But there are a lot of people who totally disagree. And in 2005 or 6, uh, this uh, fellow uh, published a book that caused a sensation because it took the opposite argument. And you may say, well, I never heard of Mark Moyer. Why should I pay any attention to him as opposed to Stacey Wallace? <laughs> Well, he holds a BA summa cum laude from Harvard and a PhD in history from Cambridge. Now, I did pretty well at a pretty good college. I did not graduate summa cum laude. You can draw your own conclusions. I did well, but I didn't do that good. You did just fine. <laughs> His book, Triumph Forsaken, the Vietnam War, 54 to 65, is volume one. There is supposedly a volume two coming out in a while. You can get it very inexpensively on Amazon, and it's very well written, even though you may possibly uh, agree or disagree, but it's very well written. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, uh, an enjoyable read. It's been, he is the classic revisionist, uh, which doesn't mean he's wrong. It just means he's going against the grain. Uh, he argues that Ngo Dinh Diem was an effective leader and that supporting the coup against him was one of the worst mistakes we ever made. In fact, I said the worst mistakes of the war. He says one of the worst mistakes we ever made in the 20th century. Along with our failure to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail and our refusal to support South Vietnam after uh, the 1973 P Paris Peace Accords. I would just very, very briefly say, uh, yeah, you can, you can truly argue about Zien. But you can't argue that by 1963, he was a right-wing, tyrannical dictator uh, who was repressing his own people. That's sort of a factual lead-up to what your conclusion is. You still say, well, he was better than anybody else, and we should have stuck with him. Uh, that's an argument. All right? Our failure to cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail, we cut, we cut it by 75%, the amount of material coming down. The CIA had told us in advance. I really i got to tell you, the CIA was on top of this. They said, the most you'll ever be able to cut it, this is in advance, is 75%. And here's the calculation of the 25%. And the 25% that you'll never cut off is enough to supply North Vietnamese and Viet Cong troops all they need, because those little guys just eat a handful of rice a day. And that'll always get through. But he's just wrong about saying that we didn't cut the Ho Chi Minh Trail. We bombed the living daylights out of it and uh, uh, did the best we could. Uh, our refusal to support South Vietnam after we got out 
Do you remember that just before DNB and Foo, they took a poll of the French people? Do you remember the percentage of the French people that still supported the French effort before DNB and Foo? 7%, ladies and gentlemen. 7%, which is, and the American version was that after the 73 Paris Peace Accords, never mind the American people, the American Congress flatly refused to support any more serious money going to, uh, now you can say that was wrong, but our elected representatives, and it was overwhelming, uh, senators in the House of Representatives, Democrats and Republicans, President Ford literally begged them to send money and arms, and the Congress refused. But we'll talk about that later. It caused an enormous, the book caused an enormous stir because it was so uh, revisionist and contrary to the accepted view of most American historians, but it's well written. 63% of Amazon readers liked it. A lot. <laughs> so if you want to, you know, if you want to test out what you think of my views, that's a book to read. What's the name of it again, sir? Triumph Forsaken. Forsaken. Moyer, M-O-Y-A-R. Just remember, he graduated from Harvard, summa cum laude. You know, by the way, this is, I'm, I'm about to say something truly nasty. <laughs> when he went for his PhD, and he, and he, he did a brilliant job, his, there's a word, what's, what do you call the advisor, you know, your thesis? No, your, your thesis. Yeah, said he's the most contentious, hostile student I've ever dealt with. All he wants to do is contradict everything that anybody else has written. And you know what? There's a lot of value in that. You should read this book and test it against your knowledge of the facts, as I have so gracefully laid it out for you. So let me ask you. Can you, can you stick with me for 10 minutes? Yeah, please. This battle, I picked because it's so typical of the Westmoreland approach. Quezon, as you can see, is literally in the middle of nowhere. This is South Vietnam. Here's the DMZ. And this is North Vietnam. Here's the ocean, the Pacific. And you go in, 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 and you finally come to Quezon out in the mountains. You can see from the topo markings, the topographical markings, uh, you're in the mountains, and here's Laos. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's about as strategic as my left foot. But General Westmoreland, who is a four-star general, doesn't agree with me. And if you had to make a decision, would you pick Stacy or would you pick Westy? Stacy. I'd pick Westy. I, uh, you know. This is it. You're looking at it. And un now follow me, because this is often compared to DMB and Fu. It's at the top of a mesa, unlike DMB and Fu, where the French were at the bottom of the valley. And the Americans understood very well that they had to control these hills and mountains, and they did at enormous bloody cost. Right? Marine General Walt, Walt was the commandant of the Marines and was a brilliant guy, but he was outranked by um, Westmoreland. He told Westmoreland flat out that he was dead wrong and explained why in great detail. And Westmoreland said, you're crazy. The Viet Cong and the North Vietnamese are loaded in there. This is what we want. We will go in, just like the French thought they would, and we'll blow them away. Because we're not down in the valley, and we don't have one helicopter. We have thousands of helicopters. And we got everything we need. We will blow them away. They will not be able to resist coming after us. And much of the fiercest fighting was to control those hills. And we knew that, and we were prepared for it. What you are looking at, by the way, is what the meaning of the phrase close air support is. And the guys flying those helicopters, the bravest people in the world. Because you can imagine what the North Vietnamese are zeroing in on. And that is a target 
of opportunity that's hard to, even I, with my little shoulder, whatever it is, Sam, even I couldn't miss. The fighting was dreadful, and it went from the, be it went from the beginning of January through the beginning of July. Uh, without a break, without a pause. Every day, every night, all the time. Jap threw four divisions of North Vietnamese troops, his heavy regular army troops at the Marines. He had artillery, he had tanks, he had fabulous intelligence. It was hard to miss us. We started with 6,000 Marines. And they said, that's no problem. <laughs> there were 35,000 of them out there. There's 6,000 of us, it's more than enough. But ultimately, as the battle raged, Westmoreland flew in uh, 20,000 more, plus air cab guys. Very, very brave men. We used helicopters, fighter jets, and B-52s, ladies and gentlemen. We flew them in from Thailand, from the Philippines, from Taiwan, from Guam. You know what it must be like if you're a North Vietnamese soldier, having a B-52 come in at eye level? It is a frightening experience. But both sides were very tough. Both sides were very, very tough. Six months, day after day, night after night. You were looking at an American soldier 50 yards away, according to the caption, 50 yards away from an American phantom jet laying down a row of bombs in front of him. 50 yards away. That's close air support, my friends. <coughs> We blew them away. It took six months, because Jap kept throwing more and more troops. All right? Remember, this is 1968, from the very beginning of January. But then, as part of the regular rotation, Westmoreland got replaced by Creighton Abrams, another World War II guy. And Creighton Abrams took one look and said, he didn't say it to Westy, he said it to his own. That's crazy. <laughs> what are you guys doing in Quezon? It makes no sense at all. The whole Westmoreland search and destroy strategy was over. And he told, Creighton Abrams told the Marines and the Air Cab guys, get out of there. There's no point to your being there. The Air Cab guys got to fly out. The Marines walked out just the way they came in. Toughest guys in the world toughest guys in the world. By the way, in the mountains, there were Army Special Forces guys, the Green Berets, working with the Montagnards, tribesmen. Very tough assignment. Very, very tough assignment and very effective. We suffered 1,500 killed, 7,500 wounded, mostly from artillery. Nobody really knows what the North Vietnamese suffered. Uh, the US estimate was 5,500. It could be more. There were rumors that it was double that. But Giap, a little later said, uh, a few years later said, Quezon? <laughs> it was a diversion. We wanted to get Westie's attention and as many of his men as far up into the northwest as we could in preparation for the Tet Offensive that started at the end of January of 68. We just wanted to sucker him up there. It had no meaning whatsoever, except as a sucker play. I tend to believe him. Yeah. Westmoreland said, are you crazy? Quezon was always his main target. Tet was the diversion. He oh. never would have sent in so many people and su suffered such casualties if Quezon wasn't his main target. Damage control, right? Mm -hmm. You can make your own judgment about that. And now we come to the end, because next week we're going to talk about Tet. The New Year! A happy festival in both North and South, uh, and it was astonishing uh, in terms of the impact. And I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. From a military point of view, it was an overwhelming military victory for us uh, and a gargantuan psychological defeat at home. This is a remarkable photograph, thanks to 
Getty Images. Uh, this is a line of uh, Viet Cong charging uh, out of the uh, forest at the start of the Tet Offensive, which mostly was aimed at the cities, by the way. But uh, you, you don't often see a photograph like this. This is us reacting. We reacted with enormous speed after the initial surprise. And this was the kind of destruction that was wreaked on most Vietnamese, South Vietnamese cities, uh, and much more changed uh, later that year in November when Richard Nixon was elected president and brought in his sidekick, uh, Dr. No. Oh, Dr. Strange? No, no, no. <laughs> Dr. Kissinger. Dr. Kissinger. <laughs> Forgive me. So I'll see you next week. At Ali, the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute at Berkshire Community College, enjoy learning simply for the love of it. Educational partners Williams College, BCC, Bard College at Simons Rock, and MCLA provide some of our outstanding faculty. Take a class in the arts, history, literature, and so much more. Contact Ali today. Meet new friends. Keep your curiosity alive.